All right. Well, we're glad that you're here this morning. Sorry we're having some technical difficulties this morning. We don't have any words this morning. Our uh, HDMI box kind of um, it uh, is not working. So, <laughs> so we had to switch up our words and our songs, and we're just going to worship the Lord this morning. So why don't you stand with us, and um, hopefully you can um, just sing along with us and be a blessing to everybody. Lord, we're just so thankful for this morning, and we're thankful that you are um, here in this place. Lord, we just want to give you our hearts and our minds this morning and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we know it's not about us, and it's not about our, um, you know, our, um, you know, the things that so easily distract us. Lord, we just want to let go of that stuff and allow your spirit to really fill us up with um, your direction, with your guidance, with your word, with the fruits of your spirit. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here this morning. May you be glorified, we pray, because you are a great God, worthy of our praise, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come. With shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Sing that again. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great. Thou art This is my desire To honor you Lord, with all my heart I worship you All 
all I have within me. Oh, I give you praise. Yeah, all that I adore is in you. Yeah. Lord, I give you my Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. No, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way. is my desire to honor you oh Lord with all my heart I worship you oh I worship you with all I have within yeah, I give you the praise Oh, all that I adore is in you It's in you Lord, I give you my heart Oh, I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me Lord, I give you my heart Yeah, I give you my soul Oh, I live for you that I take every moment I'm awake Lord have your way in me oh you have your way in me Bring life. 
light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry all these bones will sing great are you Lord? Now all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Oh, great are you Lord. It's your Exalt thee, 
Yes, we exalt Thee. Oh, we exalt Thee. Oh, Lord. Yes, we exalt. It costs. 
lost to see my sin upon that cross no i'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me so turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonder to worship. 
worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. You're all together worthy. All together wonderful to me. And Lord, we mean that with our hearts, Lord, that you are, you are wonderful. Lord, all the things that you do are wonderful. Lord, we realize that even in the middle of any of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, Lord, that you are still unchanging. Lord, there's nothing that moves you. You are like a rock and a firm foundation. And we just really thank you for that. We thank you for how you're moving in, and in this world around us. And Lord, we just want to be on page with you. Lord, we want our, our opinions and our heart to reflect your nature and your character. And so, Lord, we pray that you would, you would just fill us with your spirit so that we can be that love and that joy, that peace, and all of the fruits of your spirit just pouring out of who we are. And Lord, that is something that is just amazing. And Lord, it is a beacon of light in the darkness of this world. And so, Lord, we pray for that. We pray that you would have your way in our hearts, Lord, as we just humble ourselves. And before your word this morning, as we just listen and we hear and your spirit moves and takes us down those trails in our heart of uh, uh, where we need to go and where we need to refocus, where our eyes can be turned to you. And so, Lord, we just want to surrender to you and let you have your way. And I just thank you for each one that's here this morning. It is a blessing to be together and to have fellowship together. It's something that gives us life. And we just thank you for that. May you be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, once again, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in all of our lives. We thank you that you love everyone in this church. You love everyone in Mesa County. Lord, you love each and every person, whether they're homeless or live in a mansion. Lord, you, you love us because you came into this world and laid down your life on that cross for all of us for our sins so that we could be cleansed and forgiven, um, brought into your presence, be adopted into your family. And Lord, we thank you that um, once we are in your family, you hold us tight, you keep us close. And Lord, we see so many in foster care systems that have been bounced around so much and they don't have that uh, security like we do in Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that you would get a hold of their hearts and help them to see that ultimately they are loved by you. And so, Father, as we open up your word, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. And we just commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Genesis 29. I hope you got your Bibles ready because, um, as you noticed, the uh, TV screens are not working this morning. Got a new computer in there. And some things just didn't go right. <laughs> so uh, by next Sunday, it's uh, guaranteed to work. So anyway, turn with me to Genesis 29. We've been looking at the life of Jacob. Uh, he's the third piece of God's puzzle. In other words, you know, God said he was going to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. Abraham had one son, the son of promise, Isaac. Yeah, another one, but that was a whole different story. And then Isaac had one son, uh, Jacob, that was going to be the son of promise, even though he had twins, and we saw how that all worked out. But Jacob is the one God chose to be uh, the one that he would give the Abrahamic covenant. And what is the Abrahamic covenant? We've seen it over and over again. It was God's promise to Abraham that through his descendants, through his seed, God would, you know, put the Jewish people in the land of promise, which is Israel, that he would bless them and multiply their descendants. They would be like the sand in the seashore. They'd be like the stars in the sky, you know, innumerable, just more than you could count. The greatest promise that he gave Abraham and, and Isaac, and last week we saw he gave that same promise to Jacob, was that through their lineage, uh, through their seed, would come the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ the Savior of the world. But God also added a, a personal promise to Jacob. God promised that he would be with him always. He promised that he would not leave him or forsake him. He said he would protect him wherever he traveled. And God told him, I'm going to bring you back to this promised land and that God would fulfill every word that he gave to Jacob. 
And once again, that's exactly what Jacob needed to hear at that moment. After all, he was running for his life. His twin brother Esau wanted to kill him. But having God's word of promise was what gave him that peace, that confidence to keep going forward. And again, that's true for all of us. We are safe and secure in God's hands. We belong to the Lord. He won't leave us. He won't forsake us. He is with us always to the end of the age. And that gives us great confidence as we navigate through this crazy, troubled, rebellious world that we are living in presently. To me, it's exciting times in which we are living because the more our world goes crazy, the closer we are getting to seeing Jesus. And it's just a matter of time. So this morning we pick up Jacob's journey as he arrives at his Uncle Laban's home. This is where his mother Rebecca was from. Rebecca and Laban were brother and sister. And Rebecca sends her son Jacob back to her family 500 miles away to find a bride, to get him away from Esau, but also to find a bride. Unbeknownst to Jacob, he will also meet someone who is even more conniving, more scheming, more manipulative than Jacob has been most of his life, and that's his uncle Laban. So this chapter, it's all about Jacob finding a wife. Now, not everybody's called to be married, but with uh, Jacob, it was not an option. He had to get married. You know, it was a necessity because God's promises to Abraham depended upon Jacob finding a wife and then having children that would carry on the name and it would be part of Abraham's covenant. So chapter 29, picking up in verse 1, it says, So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Now, I, I think this is a lot better, more enjoyable a more exciting part of the journey than the first part. Remember last time we saw he's fleeing from his parents' home. He's fleeing from his twin brother that wants to kill him. He finds himself in the middle of nowhere. He puts his head on a rock. That's where he sleeps. He has that dream of Jacob's ladder, we call it. But he sees angels ascending and descending upon this ladder. Jesus says he's the ladder. He's the connection between heaven and earth. Through Christ alone we come to salvation but as he slept on that rock uh, the rock of his salvation would appear to him and would re-emphasize the wonderful promises of the abrahamic covenant so now with that newfound confidence that faith in the lord because now he has a uh, purpose you know he was a man on the run now he's a man on a mission and he goes to uh, his um, mom's relatives so look at verse 2 says, And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place in the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And as soon as they say, Oh, we're from Haran, Jacob knows I'm in the right place. This is right where I need to be because I've traveled 500 miles. Now he knows he went the right way because he's in Haran. This is where his uncle Laban and their family were from. So he knows he's in the right place. So verse 5, then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. So he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. And again, we see God's hand of providence in action here, because at that very moment, here comes Rachel. I mean, this is the whole reason why he's going here, was to find a wife. And here's his uncle's daughter, Rachel. This is long before the law said, okay, you cannot marry a close relative, so don't get weirded out by that. But she's probably off in the distance. She's working her way towards the well with the flock of sheep. And, you know, these three shepherds are hanging out there. And as she gets closer, Jacob's heart starts beating faster. And we'll see that this was truly love at first sight. Verse 7. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. You know, what Jacob is doing here is telling these three shepherds, hey, hurry up already. 
water your sheep, go out to the pasture. I want to meet this gal that's coming towards me because I think he, in his heart, he thinks she's the one. And so he's t trying to get them, get going. You know, his heart, you might say, is Twitter-pated. You know what that means. Okay. Verse uh, 8. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. So these shepherds are probably thinking, well, who is this guy? I mean, he wants to know where uh, he is. We tell him Haran. He wants to know, if J you know, Laban's okay. Yeah. And then here's R Jacob's uh, daughter, Rachel. And so Jacob's, or Laban's daughter, Rachel. So he's like, hey, you guys leave. So they're probably, what in the world's going on with this guy? You know, and they tell him, we can't go anywhere until all the sheep arrive and we water them. We get, you know, this is a big stone in front of this well, and it takes a few men to move this stone, and then we'll water the sheep. Then we'll go. Well, look at verse 9. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. How many shepherdesses do we have here this morning? Anybody? No? Okay. Not much of a profession anymore. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, uh, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. I mean, this is great. All of a sudden, this guy that we've seen, he's a homeboy. You know, he's pretty, you know, much a, a mama's boy growing up. He turns into Mr. Macho Man here. He single-handedly rolls this big stone away from the well of the mouth. Uh, the, the water here comes out. I believe he's not only trying to get these guys to hurry up and get away, but he's also trying to show off a little bit, I think, to Rachel. Remember, he's about 77, 78 years old at this time. That would be like 50 in our years, probably, because he'll live to be 147. So anyway... This is love at first sight. Now, for some of us, that's how it was when we met our future spouse. It was with me when I met Elizabeth. Love at first sight. I don't know about her. I think it was, but it was with me anyway. So how do I know that you know he knew this was the one? Well, look at verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel. I mean, just out of the blue, he kissed Rachel and then lifted up his voice and wept. I mean, how romantic. But then he gets a little weird by starting to cry. And she's probably wondering, what's going on here? I think Jacob was calling out to God, though, with the cry of thanksgiving and praise because, I mean, he, again, has been this man on the run. He's been a conniver most of his life. He's had this great encounter with God. Now his whole life has been changed. And so he sees God's hand working and, and it's all coming together so quickly and beautifully. And so here he just starts to cry out, I think, to the Lord. Now, I know that's similar to what many of you have experienced in your own life. Maybe some of you were like me growing up. You were rebellious. You were living you know, worldly, fleshly lives. You get saved. Christ comes into your life. You're radically changed. And all of a sudden your whole world is rocked because now you have the rock, Jesus, dwelling inside of you. Your sins have been forgiven. You were dead in your sins. Now you're alive in Christ. And you just knew that Jesus was real. You knew he was alive. He came into your heart. He took up residence in your life and he gave you eternal life. And for those of us that went through that, to me, it was a radical salvation. Man, you just don't go back. Why would you go back to the ways of the world? Because you know who Christ is. Well, we see here his life has been changed. And this is that moment when he realizes, wow, God is at work. He's, he's got his hand upon me. So he kisses Rachel and then he cries as he lifts up his voice. Verse 12, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. Remember, Laban, her father, is Rebekah's sister, uh, brother. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Now, this reminds me of... Um, when Abraham sent his servant Eliezer to the same place to find a wife for his son Isaac. 
And the same kind of thing happened. He shows up and this, Eliezer's got all these camels. He's loaded down with a lot of gold and jewelry and everything else. Laban sees this guy and he gets all excited. Wow, this guy's wealthy. Sure, you can marry my sister. And that's what he was after was the wealth. And so now he hears, my sister's son is here. He's the, the heir to the fortune. And so he's excited. Come on, welcome. I've, I'd love to see you, Jacob. I want you to work here for free. You know, come in here for a month and blah, blah, blah. So he's all excited here. And he's thrilled to see his long lost nephew. But as we'll see, Jacob, he's no match for his uncle Laban. I mean, Laban is one manipulative man. Now, even though Jacob lived most of his life as that kind of schemer, manipulator, his recent encounter with God has really made a tremendous impact on his own life. And he is a changed man. Yes, he's far from perfect. When Christ came into your life, you have a new, you become a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. But you're not perfect. We don't become perfect until we're brought into His presence and we're given a resurrection glorified body. Our position in Christ, yeah, you're holy, you're forgiven, you're clean. But practically, we still stumble, we still bumble around. And we see this with, with Jacob. He's a new creation. He's a new man. The Lord's got a hold of his heart. But, you know, he's going in the right direction, but far from perfect. Laban, on the other hand, he's still got a lot of years of deception left in him. Verse 15, then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Uh, again, Laban is a real con artist. He is a master manipulator. In fact, Laban will pretty much control Jacob's life for the next 20 years. He's going to have Jacob under his thumb. At the same time, we're going to see a lot of growth in Jacob's life. We'll see a lot of growth in his character. God will use this situation in Jacob's life to mold him and shape him into the man that God wants him to be. He's a great illustration to me, so it's not on the screen, so you've got to write it down. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But here's Laban saying to Jacob, I see you're a hard worker. You've been here for a month. So now what can I pay you? How can I pay you? Sounds good on the surface. But Laban just wants to keep Jacob around because, again, he's thinking there must be an inheritance on the horizon. Look at verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. My granddaughter corrected me because I kept saying Leah. I said, how do you know? <laughs> okay, I'll call her Leah. So Leah instead of Leah. I don't know. I always thought it was Leah. But she said, Grandpa, you can't keep calling her Leah. Her name is Leah. Otherwise, it would be spelled like this. And I was like, oh, okay, you're 14. You, know, you got it. <laughs> so Laban now had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the young, name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. So Rachel is the physically attractive one here of these two sisters. Leah, not as much. Uh, it doesn't say that Leah was ugly. Don't picture her being ugly. She may have been, but we don't know. But in comparison to Rachel, she just was not as attractive. Let's put it that way to be nice. The main point is Jacob is already madly in love with Rachel. His eyes, you know, look to her. He, he wants to marry her. So anybody you put next to Rachel, they just don't measure up. But watch what happens. Verse 18. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than uh, that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, 
and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. I mean, he was really madly in love with Rachel. It seemed like a couple days, few days, seven years, just so he could have the privilege of marrying Rachel. This is a great example, 1 Corinthians 13, where he goes through love is patient. Well, seven years, that's a long time. Uh, love is kind. It, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, about love, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Then it says love never fails. And so that's where he is in his heart. Just seems like a few days. A great picture of how much Jacob really loved Rachel. Uh, he would basically work seven years for free just to marry her. Now, John Corson summarized uh, this list between love and lust, and there's a huge difference. Love, that's what we're talking about. That's that agape love, that God love that He puts inside of us. Lust is what our flesh does. Lust after the flesh is not of the Lord. So John Corson summarizes it by saying, Love gives. Lust takes. Love waits. Lust won't. Love is patient. Lust is pressure. Love says no. Lust says now. End quote. I would add a couple more to that list. One is love is other-centered. Lust is self-centered. Love never fails, but lust never fulfills. You're never fulfilled when you're lusting for something or someone. Love is what never fails. Lust and love, they're as different as night and day. The Bible is clear that our flesh is driven by lust, but the Spirit leads us in love. You know, here's a great verse, Galatians 5, 16. Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So important that we walk in the Spirit. You can't live a life that's pleasing to the Lord unless you're walking in the Spirit. You try to say, well, I'll try harder tomorrow, God, to make it right, to do the right things, and, and you'll, eventually you'll fail because your flesh is weak. But when you're filled with the Spirit, He gives you the strength to do things God's way. Well, look at verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, this is after working for seven years. Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. Jacob's being very clear. Okay, Laban, I've held up my end of the deal. I've worked seven years. Now I just want to be married. I want to have my wife. I want to be together with her. It looks like Jacob and Rachel are finally going to get married, live happily ever after. But not so fast, because again, we're dealing with Laban. And he is not an honorable person. Verse 22, And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And so this is the big wedding feast they're having for Jacob and Rachel. And they're celebrating. It probably goes late into the night. Now it came to pass, verse 23, In the evening that he took Leah, Leah his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. So uh, Laban sneaks his daughter Leah into the tent, and you don't think that, you know, Jacob's a moron, you know, and he doesn't know what's going on here because he thinks he's going into the tent, and it's dark. He thinks, oh, I'm going to be with my wife Rachel, but it's Leah, and he doesn't know this. And he went into her, verse 24, and Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? So he's wondering, what in the world? Why did you deceive? And I'm sure, and it's not hard to imagine, as he's saying, why did you deceive me? But he's probably thinking back on his own life. Because what did Jacob just do? Why is he fleeing? Why did he leave his parents and his twin brother? Because he deceived his dad, Isaac. He dressed up like Esau to get the blessing from his father. And now it's all coming back to him. Again, there are consequences to our sin. We eventually reap what we've sown. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. 
It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever man sows that he will also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh corruption. You sow to the spirit, you'll reap of the spirit everlasting life. Now, again, don't think God was mad at Jacob. Don't think he's punishing Jacob. He's rubbing his nose in it. Ha, I got you, Jacob. That's not it. God simply took him through the school of hard knocks, and God is showing Jacob, this is how you do things my way, and we're going to stop doing things your way. So God never stopped loving Jacob, but he's taking him through this time of training. Well, look at verse 26. And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. I'm sure as Jacob hears these words, his heart is cut again, because that's exactly what happened with his older twin brother Esau. Jacob took the, the right of firstborn before Esau. Now, Remember what I said last week, that there's a difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and condemnation from the enemy. Conviction of the Holy Spirit, He comes upon us, convicting us to drive us to the Lord, to lead us to Jesus. Satan brings condemnation, but it's always to push us away from God. Satan wants you to think, oh, you blew it again? God doesn't want to hear from you. Just do your own thing. Go away. God's done with you. Don't listen to that. That's condemnation. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit convicts us when we blow it and sin to lead us back to the Lord, to show us this is where you find the cleansing, that refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. As we'll see with Jacob, he fought through the condemnation as his father in law tells him these things, and he will simply move ahead with the Lord's help. Verse 27. So Laban here is still speaking. He says, Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. So Laban's sneaky little plan works to perfection. He marries off both of his daughters in one week. So he has this relation with Leah, and he goes, okay, you got to be with her for a week. And then I'll give you Rachel. And then you're going to work another seven years for me for free. So he thinks, wow, I've got a great deal here. This is Laban's reasoning. Verse 28, then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter, Rachel, as wife also. And Laban gave his maid, Bilhah, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid, then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. So after Rachel and um, Jacob come together, he now serves them another seven years. I'm sure Laban must have congratulated himself on being such a successful schemer. He got 14 years of free labor from Jacob. What Laban failed to realize is that this was all part of God's plan. God was going to turn this weird, bad situation into something glorious. God would use this to bring forth the 12 tribes of Israel from these four women, Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and what's the other one? Zilpah. A couple names you can scratch off your baby list. Zilpah and Bilhah. Now, once again in the Bible, God clearly defines marriage as one husband, one wife. Polygamy has no place in God's design for marriage. He made that very clear back in Genesis chapter 2. He says, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife. The two become one flesh. The four can never become one. The five can never become one. Only man, woman, coming together in marriage, become one in the Lord. We see this from the very beginning, that in polygamy, there's always going to be competition. There's always going to be hurt feelings. There's always going to be fleshly things taking place. Now, even in verse 30, notice it says, Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah, which again is sad for Leah. But it's kind of also understandable from Jacob's standpoint. He didn't want to marry Leah. He wanted to marry Rachel. I've worked 14 years for Rachel. Sneaky Uncle Laban. 
You know, I'm sure he was upset about this. I can't believe he double-crossed me. Well, look at verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So again, verse 30 says Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, but here we see that that God saw that Leah was unloved. That word unloved in the Hebrew literally means hated and despised. At this point, Jacob hated and despised Leah. Every time he'd look at her, except for when it was dark, but every time he looked at her, he was angry, he was mad. I got tricked. I didn't want you to be my wife. She didn't deserve to be hated and despised. This was her dad's doing. Laban thought he was doing her a favor by tricking Jacob into marrying her, but the result was not good. She would have been Better off waiting for Mr. Wright to show up and get married to the person God brought into her life rather than being set up with someone who really didn't love her. As we'll see, eventually her love, because she really did love Jacob, her love for him will be recognized. It's going to take a long time. When a person is unequally yoked, when a person is in a bad marriage or in an extramarital relationship, there will always be pain, heartache, and suffering. But praise the Lord that God can bring healing, He can bring restoration, He can bring redemption into the most difficult situation we might find ourselves in. And Leah is a great example of this. Um, Even though she's despised, even though she's hated by Jacob, Notice his sins here, God extends his love, his grace to her. God's going to produce fruit in her life by blessing her with children. And that's the only way Jacob sees her initially is just, she's one that's going to bear me children. That's all he wanted from her. Well, God blesses her. Actually, six out of the 12 sons of Jacob, Leah bears, bores, has children. Six out of the... Six out of the 12 uh, tribes of Israel, let me put it that way, come through Leah. So I wasn't trying to be funny. You just think I'm stupid. So (laughs) stupid is as stupid does. In other words, so she felt like an outcast. She felt like God, you know, nobody cared about me, but God loves her and God produces this wonderful fruit in her. And in fact, two of her sons, God will exalt to a place of prominence within Israel. One, Levi. Levi, the Levites, would become the spiritual leaders in Israel when they come into the promised land. The other one that she has that was lifted up in prominence was Judah. Why Judah? Well, through Judah would come the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ. What a blessing. She was part of that lineage. And so God was good. He was gracious to Leah, even though her husband and her sister, we'll see later on, treated her with contempt. Now, there might be a a wife, maybe a couple wives in here today that can identify with Leah. Hopefully you can be encouraged by the fact that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he loves you. He values you. He wants to work in your life. He wants to bless your life. He sent Jesus. If you don't know Christ, He sent Jesus for you because He loves you, wants to save you. He does have a plan and purpose for your life. Here's a great verse. You need to write it down because you won't see it on the screen. Isaiah 54, verses 5 and 6. It says, for, and this is for any wife here, you feel like, eh, my husband just doesn't really care for me that much or whatever it is. Here's a great verse. For your maker, that's the creator of the heavens and the earth, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. So what a promise that you can cling to. He's our maker. He's our protector. He's our redeemer. Verse 6 goes on to say, For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. Sounds exactly what God did for Leah. You know, she was despised. She was forsaken. She was grieved in spirit. And yet God says, I've called you. I'm your maker. I'm your husband. Husbands, God has called you to be a blessing to your wife 
Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. That's heavy duty. I'm supposed to love Elizabeth with the same love Jesus has for me? <laughs> That's impossible, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit working in me. That's why you have to go to the source, the fountain of life, the fountain of living water, Jesus Christ. He fills us with the, the, the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, and peace. And then we can love our spouse, our wife, just like Christ loves us. Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let each one of you husbands in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so the same goes for the wives. The only way you can love that numbskull you're married to is by being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you'll want to kick him out. Watch the progression, though, in her heart, because God blesses her. The first four children that Jacob have come through Leah. So notice the progression here as she is still striving to get love from Jacob. Verse 32. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. The name Reuben, the firstborn, means see a son. So she's saying to Jacob, see, I bore you a son. Now you got to love me. It didn't change Jacob's heart at this point. God still has a lot of work to do in Jacob's heart. But look at verse 33. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. So Simeon means the Lord has heard. Hmm. She knows the Lord has heard her prayer, that she just wants to be loved by Jacob. And so she's hoping that Simeon will be the son that will speak to Jacob's heart and that he will turn his heart toward her. Doesn't happen yet. Verse 34, she conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to to me because I have borne him three sons therefore his name was called Levi Levi it means attached it means to join so she's thinking wow I've given him a third son surely this will make him want to be attached to me he'll want to join his heart with my heart again sadly it's not the case verse 35 and she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. For a season, we'll see she'll have two more later. But for now, she stops bearing. So the fourth son, she names appropriately Judah, or praise. It seems that she has stopped trying to win Jacob over. No matter how many sons she gives him, he just does not love her, does not change his heart. This is actually a good thing for Leah. This is a good time in her life because she's no longer looking to Jacob to fulfill her need to be loved. So she praises the Lord. That's what it says here. Notice she cries out, Now I will praise the Lord. In other words, she's found her true identity in the Lord instead of trying to get it from Jacob. You know, years ago, uh, stuff was going on and you know, Elizabeth's like, what if you're not a pastor anymore? What are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to be a Christian. That's my identity is in Christ. It's not being a pastor. That's what I do, but that's not where my identity is. Your, our identity has to be in the Lord. And this is something that we should all desire and long for. Jesus is the one who is perfect. Jesus is the only one that can meet all of our needs. He's the only one that says will stick closer to us than any brother. Only Jesus is worthy to be praised and exalted and lifted up. After all, only Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. Jacob's fourth son. Leah's fourth son. Judah, what an appropriate name Leah gives at this time in her life. It's as if she's finally starting to realize her true value, her true worth comes from the Lord. 
not from Jacob. Instead of focusing on Jacob, she now begins to look to God. Now, I know that's very hard for a lot of us because just in our natural state, we want to be loved, we want to be appreciated, nothing wrong with that. But again, it's not fair to other people to try to have them meet your needs because nobody can meet your needs but Jesus. Philippians 4.19, here's another verse you can write down. It says, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things shall be added to you. Here's an interesting side note. Turn with me in your Bibles a few chapters over to Genesis 49. We're going to close here looking at a few verses in Genesis 49. Why is this an interesting side note? Because, again, Leah just wanted to be loved, but now she has that connection with God. She's praising the Lord. When all is said and done, Jacob, in chapter 49 here, he's on his deathbed. He's 147 years old. He's got his 12 sons gathered around him. He's just blessed them, and he's blessing them. But he's telling them, I'm about to die, and I'm about to go home, and I want you to bury me in a certain place. Watch what happens here. Verse 29 of Genesis 49. Then he charged them and said to them, these are his 12 sons that are around him. I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. We saw that back in chapter 23. There, so Jacob's telling his sons, there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. That's his grandparents. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, his parents. And there I buried Leah. Hmm. Not Rachel. That's where he buried Leah. Rachel died in childbirth with Benjamin, and it was on outside of Bethlehem. That's where he buried her. But here in this very special cave of Machpelah. This is where he buries Leah. It's almost like a sign of saying, man, at the end he finally realized she deserved to be loved. She was a gift from God. You know, God had blessed her tremendously. Six of you boys came because of her. And so don't ever think you're unloved, uncared for. We have an amazing God in heaven that loves us despite of ourselves. It's because of His amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that we can hold fast to the promises You have given us. Lord, we know that we're to love our spouse, our children, grandchildren, our brothers and sisters in Christ with your agape love. And Lord, I pray that you would refill us overflowing this morning with your Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace would just be produced in abundance in all of our lives. Those closest to us, Lord, would recognize the work you have done in us, the work you're doing through us, and Lord, we look to you to meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for what's going on in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you're on the throne of the universe and you're on the throne of our hearts. You're on the throne overseeing our country. And Lord, we don't know exactly how everything's going to play out you know, this week, next week, Lord, but we thank you that you are in control and we look to you because as we see more and more rebellion in the world around us, we know the clock is ticking and in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up into your presence and we're going to stand before you in glory. But Lord, we know that there is great tribulation that's coming upon this world where those who have rebelled, rejected you, 
will face your judgment and wrath. But Lord, before that time, I pray that you would motivate us to take the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. Lord, now is not the time to hide the light under a bushel, a basket, but now is the time to be light and salt in this world. People need to know that you are alive, risen from the grave, and you are truly this world's only hope. And we thank you, Lord, for being here in our midst. We pray that we would uh, worship you, praise you. Judah would be on our lips, Lord, as we praise the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. If you need prayer, please come on down. Uh, We'd love to pray with you and hopefully encourage you in Christ. You have poured out grace You brought me out of darkness You have filled me with peace Giver of mercy You're my help in time of need Lord, I can't help but see You have broken every curse Blessed Redeemer You have set this captive free Lord, I can't help but sing
Father, we do thank you. All your promises are sure. Your word is true. We thank you, Lord, that we can hold fast to all that you have given us in your word. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us to live out your word. Uh, we want to walk in your goodness, in your grace, in your love, your compassion for those around us. Lord, help us to love one another even as you have loved us. You told us that the world will know that we are your disciples by the love that we have for one another. And so, Father, produce that good fruit in our lives for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. 